Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is God's Teeth for Delta Green the Role-Playing Game by Arcturian Publishing, Part 1. Ok, first a bit of history. Originally a part of the successful second Delta Green Kickstarter, God's Teeth was released in 2023 as a PDF and in early 2024 as a hardback book. It was written almost entirely by Caleb Stokes and originally broadcast as a seven-part actual play series on RolePlayingPublicRadio.com in 2015, beginning life as a Delta Green game he ran for his friends. Now before I go any further, I want to give you one about the content, themes and subject matter of God's Teeth. It's dark. Very, very dark. Think how dark you imagine it could be and, yes, God's Teeth goes there. Be a friend to your players and don't hit them with this campaign without fair warning. Despite what we believe, we don't know people half as well as we think we do. And, well, if it was something you were really uncomfortable with, then you would probably think less of someone if they hit you with the stuff God's teeth is built upon without a heads up. Of course, if your players are insistent that they're absolutely fine with the themes, then my advice would be to deal with them straight for maximum effect. Right to the cover. A magnificent disturbing piece by Dennis Detweller, made all the more worse by the horrific fanged woman appearing to be eating the hair of a child. And yes, this is relatively tame compared to what's inside. Onto the inside. There'll be spoilers from this point on, and in every other video following this one in this series, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. Once we get past the blood soaked interior, we are twice given the phrase, Shredni Vashtar went forth, his thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white, his enemies called for peace but he brought them death. Shredni Vashtar the beautiful. This will become important later on. Once we get past the content, we reach the introduction. It tells us that God's Teeth follows the evolution of Delta Green from the early 21st century under the influence of a horrifying unnatural power. It's in four parts, Go Forth, Red Thoughts, White Teeth and the Hidden God, and follows how this power claims a handful of agents, using them to prey on other unnatural threats, sharpening them into perfect teeth for its feeding through violence and trauma, and it spans 20 years. Go Forth takes place in 2001, with a group of characters that are not full Delta Green agents. The splintering of Delta Green has the future agents forge a timeline of mistake and bitter choices. They are marked as teeth by an ever-hungering cosmic entity, and it mentions that it could be a transition point from a 1990s campaign. The Long Years is an in-between section where they are recruited as full agents by the programme in the post-9-11 state. Due to the influence of this cosmic terror, they begin being able to sense unnatural energies and become drawn to unnatural horrors, cursed to feed their god with death. Red Thoughts is set in 2016, and the repercussions of the events of Go Forth come into public awareness, with the agents being told to make them vanish, and they begin gradually realising that they've been touched by something from beyond. White Teeth sees the horrors of Go Forth hidden again, and the agents see those that have survived these horrors becoming monsters themselves. The teeth are being sharpened by murderous youths, as the agents begin to understand what it is that they have become. The Spiral is another in-between section from 2016 to 2020, and new agents may join the programme and be marked as teeth. Terrors begin converging on the agents, and they find the influence of the entity beginning to grow. A tip from the FBI brings forth another threat from the past. The Hidden God, also set in 2020, has the world embracing the plague and the agents following the consequences of their actions, confronting the cost of intervention and having encounters with impossible enemies, finally succumbing to the force that marked them. At the bottom of the page we have a Be Warned box out that warns about the contents of God's Teeth. And after this we move on to the God that Feeds. Here it tells us that an entity of near omniscient force has taken an interest in the agents. One that holds them in servitude and has the meaning of their life to exist as a tool, as teeth. Feeding on natural expressions of power and moving from state to state, reality to unreality, form to entropy. It uses the agents as an intention to manipulate them for its unending hunger to hunt and destroy. It's held humanity as thralls many times, always present though invisible, except to those that are its teeth. It was worshipped by a cult around 5,000 years ago as the ferocious Bast, but the hunger of the god consumed its own cult and it withdrew. Bast became less ferocious and became a protector against evil spirits and diseases. A figurative domestic counterpart to Sekhmet, Bast became the goddess of healing and house cats. The name Bast is used for the force at work here that sharpens the agents like weapons and has them seeking out unnatural power. This power is its prey that sustains it. 
It's alleged that the Earth gods of myth hide in the land of dreams, severed from humanity, though if they do hide there, it's with good reason. Bast moulds destiny to fulfil its hunger, causing animals and humans to achieve its unknowable goals, though they normally have no idea that they are saving this power. The manipulation of causality manifests in tiny ways that cause odd synchronicities. These are highlighted throughout the campaign. Bast's attention waxes and wanes, and this may have gaps of years before becoming intense and active, without explanation, with synchronicity building around them. One of the themes of God's Teeth is that of agency and fatalism. Their lives are sharpened by the unnatural power that has come to influence them, which in turn brings the watchful eyes of Delta Green upon them. They are viewed by all as tools that are to be used until no longer of use and then discarded, and the heroism of the agents stems from their struggle against this control, with their revelation being that even the act of resistance serves this nameless entity. We then go into discussion on fatalist horror. Many tools are provided for handlers to reveal Bast's intentions, with synchronicities throughout, all showing what is planned. Becoming one of the teeth, though a curse of predestination, is not prescriptive for players. They may feel helpless and the idea of this campaign is to explore their struggle that their destiny is already written and a consistent portrayal of Bast helps keep the horror within the game. One facet of that is cosmic patience. Bast is infinite and the manipulation of the agent's life before Earth formed and disappearing at times to the point where they falsely believe they are in control. They are not. Another is a predatory motif. The synchronicities of Bast should guide handlers into creating their own signs. Humans' limited senses see Bast's hunger as that of animal savagery, though the force's hunger seeks the unnatural. Bast speaks to its teeth via infinite simulation, changing reality toward the probability whereby it has greater unnatural consumption, though this may be the inexplicable to the agents. In addition to this, there is no escape for the agents to choose anything outside the influence of Bast, or they would have chosen to not be teeth. When they come to this realisation, it funnels their lives towards a deeper purpose. The humans are essentially animals trapped in a cage of intersecting histories, something they are forced to accept. Any indications of cosmic conspiracy are too infrequent, personal and easily dismissed to be important, and only those of impossible coincidence over their lifetime can help them understand their purpose. We also give them some general guidelines. It's important to know if your players are able and willing to engage with the terror of fatalism, or else this campaign just may not be for them. The illusion of freedom is important to focus on from time to time, and as a matter of scale. The players may become frustrated at the helplessness their characters find themselves in. It's also important to move quickly to move them on from cycles of existential angst. More mundane duties should be focused on such as that of Bonds and Delta Green. The immediacy of their actual life should reduce group paralysis. It also mentions that when they are having discussions to debate plans and theories that they should be encouraged to do it in character, showing the emotions of the agents in these time periods. It's also important that the handler reiterates the clues and that they should be generous with this. There is a small box out here called The Price, The Marks of Bast, where it stresses that Bast's manipulation of causality will eventually physically mark those who serve as its teeth and that they may be recognised by the faithful. The next section is called New Teeth. It points out that those chosen of Bast are not immune to its hunger. After all, teeth break, and in this instance, new ones grow to replace them. New teeth should be members of the programme. It suggests using the following system to replace agents that fall in the line of duty. The first phase is the bureaucratic phase, moles. Essentially, at any point during the first part of the scenario, go forth. The events that transpire could give Delta Green plenty of reasons to focus on the agents. It is, after all, simultaneously suspicious, fearful and covetous. Replacement agents should be assigned as consultants to help the teeth in their investigations, while privately they've been informed that they are to spy on the agents and report suspicious behaviour back up the command chain. Should more than one be assigned, they are to spy not only on the teeth, but on each other too, to make sure that they don't turn. What the programme finds disturbing is never filtered back down the chain. They can only report back what the teeth choose to reveal to them, or what they can put together through observation and uncanny coincidence. The obscuring of the surveillance helps the programme mould the function of the spies. Should the teeth keep everything a secret, then the activity of the outlaws in Go Forth is enough for them to be monitored closely, and if it is revealed that they have supernatural powers, then the function of the spies changes to be somewhat more like test subjects. The second phase is syncretic phase, teeth. Moles should be played out until it stops being interesting, and then scar them with the mark of Bast. Reality serves Bast with regard to the original teeth, and the newcomer has been drawn in. They serve Bast, not the programme. They've always served the god. It is stressed that if at all possible, the new member of the teeth should be scarred in front of the current ones. 
The existing can take a small sand hit if they see their curse reflected in others, and should the current teeth reveal what it means, the sand loss is reflected back at the freshly marked. Should there be multiple agents that are to be initiated, it suggests leading them into a world of synchronicity one at a time, then letting them sweat and then waiting for the terrible moment just when they think they have escaped it. We then shift focus onto the powers of the teeth. Bast only manifests through its teeth and they are its avatars with certain powers conferred upon them that emerge during Go Forth. These emphasise the awful curse that comes with being proxy to a god, while also lending a theme of continuity if scenarios are run during the gaps present in God's teeth. These abilities seem advantageous at first, but ultimately mean that they've become the tools of some unnatural horror, and it stresses the point that the devil's tools won't ever tear down the devil's house. The first ability they have is that of scent. They can smell people and places that are infected with the unnatural, and it can cost them sand if the handler deems it so, who also decides whether it manifests, though it is encouraged to allow agents to come up with their own reasons. If they pass the sand roll, then they can recognise the infection and how strong it is, and if it's something they can recognise from the past. This shifts between meaty and nauseating, and it can't detect those exposed to only bast, that would emanate from the chosen of bast if they've had other unnatural contact. It has no way of distinguishing between victims, bystanders or practitioners, and no way of telling what the smell indicates, that they could find out. Only teeth can detect it. Once they catch the scent, it grows more powerful if they remain near the source, and leads to a bloody impulse to commit murder, and they know that killing the source of the scent will alleviate this. Leaving the scene causes it to subside. If the sand test fails, there are two outcomes. If the scent is new, nothing happens, no sand is lost. However, if they have smelled it before, it creates a false positive where they can detect the target doused in the scent, even if they may not be. If they refuse to attack the source, they lose one sand. A fumble produces the same result. We have a table here with the other powers of the teeth in, but let's skip that and move on to the next ability, Call. The agents, having been exposed to Bast, have their dreams twisted. From time to time, teeth who lose sand to the unnatural will wake from the nightmares where they had a hunger and could devour, with all humanity stripped away. A specific detail or two can be told to the teeth as a result of this. They may in turn want to know more and try to contact their patron, which involves a sand roll. If they succeed, they receive no guidance. Reality holds and they suffer no sand loss. Should they fail, however, they receive a vision that makes little sense, but that answers one question accurately. This should be put together with as much symbolism as possible. They lose one sand. If they fumble, however, things are much worse. A revelation specific to the agent's brain happens whereby they dream of a universe made of a single dying organism. They witness dark matter that acts as the circulatory system of God and feel a cosmic hunger that has choked them for eons. They will then suffer seizures, nosebleeds and other trauma symptoms and take D8 sand loss and half that of hit points. They then gain points in their natural skill equal to the sand loss. If they try another call roll, this should be replaced with something found in investigating Bast. More on that in a moment. The last power is that of Hunt. This will only happen for any agent once. It may trigger if they hit one or two hit points, and could trigger superhuman strength and endurance. They can still be killed by a lethality roll though. Firstly they make a sand roll, and a success means nothing happened. Failure causes the agent to lose 2d4 sanity, and they gain that amount of hit points, despite any injuries that they may have suffered. They can continue fighting with gaping wounds, missing limbs, disembowelment and the like. Temporal insanity at this time manifests as the need to struggle and fight. They become homicidal, rage-filled creatures attacking all and sundry, unable to separate friend from enemy. Anybody witnessing an agent moving after such horrific damage takes a small sand hit. The effects of this power are disguised by Bast from the scent of other teeth. If they manage to survive the hunt, they lose the hit points they gained, and as such if they hit zero hit points, they can only be saved with a successful first aid roll in the next few minutes. They will suffer a permanent injury, and trying to remember anything from the event triggers a sand roll, with a bloodthirsty euphoria being all they can remember. So now we go into investigating Bast. At the point where the agents learn of their connection to the nameless god in history, the science and occultism, plus their own visions and dreams, will help them find what they're looking for. They can look back to when a nameless god was worshipped using four skills, anthropology, archaeology, history and occult, and they can work together. If they visit the Egyptian National Library and Archives in Cairo and have skill in Ancient Egyptian at 50% or more, they get a plus 20% of these roles. The same happens if they hire an academic translator. Should an agent waste a personal pursuit, they get a plus 20% to their same skill and the bonus stacks until the first roll passes, but then they take one sample from helplessness for each failure. Every time they succeed, they can attempt an occult roll to find out more details with no bonus. When you know how many passes they have, you refer to this table here, which says what they found out. 
The first success reveals the lioness. When teeth see that this appears to have happened before and look for an historical precedent, they will be led to ancient Egypt and the myths of Bast, and were perhaps Bastet, Mao or Bast, a ferocious goddess at the time, who had a sister in the north, Sekhmet, that has similar characteristics, likewise Sobek and Anubis. Bast and Sekhmet, being known as the Eyes of Ray, slew Apophis, a giant ocean horror. Bast's protection came at a cost. She hungered to the blood of men, and her priests are said to have lured her to sleep by mixing blood with red wine. Inversely, she assisted mankind while consuming it. The occult bonus will flag that the battle with Apophis is a reflection not of order opposing chaos, but of predator devouring prey. The second success reveals the Black Rites. The agents can find records at Memphis and Bubastis of the works of Professor Enoch Bowen. Bad translations of the Al-Azif by Abd al-Hazred, where he relates accounts of Bast and Sekhmet, and discredited etchings from the walls of a long-destroyed tomb in southern Gebel Dosha. These black rites started in southern Egypt before 3000 BC, and was codified religious abuse of children, magic and torture. Bast's priests used orphans or snatched children to enact the mysteries of their cult on, and they were kept in a state of prolonged pain and kept prelingual. The pain of the victims called out to Bast, who sent warriors known as her teeth to avenge the children. Priests of Bast would gladly lay down their lives by offering their blood to make drunk Bast, to refrain her from consuming the world. The teeth sought out new prey, dying in a helpless war against the unnatural. Those that survived became the next generation of sorcerer priests. The occult bonus reveals ferals. Bast's worship has occasionally been associated with that strange behaviour of animals and children, with it not being clear as to whether she finds any distinction between them. We have a box out here called Unnatural Revelations. It discusses that the agents needing to delve into the area of forbidden knowledge to understand the force that is controlling their lives, which goes deeper than human conceptions of history. Important realisations can be pieced together by the teeth. With each successful roll into the worship of Bast, they can try an unnatural roll with a plus 20% after the second worship success, or plus 40% with the third. Any agent that uncovers the complete origins of Bast realises all of the below at once like a wave of sanity destruction. The first success makes them understand that humanity's sciences are a pathetic attempt to understand an unnatural hunger within the cosmos. They gain plus 1% unnatural and lose one san. The second test can be made with the same modifier. The second success hits them with the revelation that this hunger has an intent. It's a nameless god that feeds on death, with a desire to prey upon entities that have found methods of cheating death, and that it chooses servants to manipulate as proxies in the hunt. Again, they take the same sand hit and the natural gain is above, as well as being allowed another unnatural test of plus 20%. The third success reveals that this nameless entity created and shaped the death of the universe itself. Reality discords by Azathoth and life sparked by Shubnagarath feed the nameless god, with its servants supplying its favourite sustenance while slowly becoming the prey itself. The agent loses D8 sand and gains plus 4% unnatural. And then we move on to the third success, the taming of Bast. Continuing on this quest of discovery about Bast needs some deviant interpretation of history. They can find out about a stone that commemorates the Second Dynasty Civil War that killed 47,000 rebels of the Pharaoh Kasakemwi in the writings of Enoch Bowen. Certain fringe historians think of this death count as literal and support Bowen's claim that the true cause of the battle was the Pharaoh's advisor, Nefren Kar. The draft document alludes to Bast's fanatical teeth that were killed and afterwards through advising Kasakemwi's son, Josa, and then as the Black Pharaoh, Nefren Kar led a purge of the sects of Bast and altered historical records of them. The cult moved north to Babastus, with Bast transforming into a goddess of domesticity, fertility and revelry. The lion became a domesticated house cat. With this softening image and the perversion of her rites, her worship spread. The war with the Black Pharaoh continued and new teeth were summoned deep in the Sahara Desert. Bast warriors allied with those of Sneferu and drove Nefren Kar out of power, with the new pharaoh turning a blind eye to the cult's cruelty. Nitocris resurrected and worshipped Nefren Kar in the Sixth Dynasty, and once again Bast warriors battled, with some indicating that they were instrumental in the drowning of Nitocris's subjects, with the fear of Bast driving Nitocris to self-entombment. It's also said that their presence made Akhenaten suppress the worship of Nile Athater, and as it became clear that Bast had no care for worship, that they abandoned Egypt's many gods to the worship of the sun god Aten. It's even said that Nile Athatep had his revenge when Akhenaten's successes branded his works as those of a mad criminal. We have a box out here which discusses the Egyptian hieroglyphic meaning of Natyarhat. It's said that Old Egyptian contains consonants not found in English and leaves vowels out entirely. 
The hieroglyphs that mean tooth are represented by NCHT, with the C sounding like that in China, only harder. H is like normal, only with a hard exhalation. If an A is added between the consonants, we have R, as in father. With this, we get Na Cha A Hat, which means tooth, the agents themselves. Moving back to the investigation of Bast, the occult role for the third success discovers a biogenesis. It's apparent that the dark rites of Bast appear multiple times throughout history, centuries apart and without active censorship. The fourth and final success is around the origins of Bast. In around the 130th century, the land goddess of forgotten Lemuria had worship that was prominent in the Second Empire of Atlantis. Their priests battled a mighty sea god and monstrous peoples from under the waves, so they must have been unsuccessful as Atlantis sank. The Atlantean diaspora came to Africa, bringing their hungry goddess with them to Egypt as Bast, being inherited by humanity as the weapon of a failed war against sea demons. The occult role for the fourth success discovers lacunae. The agents can find out the details of the true cult of Bast were never put to record, with the writings of Enoch Bowen and Abd al Hazra being left patchy in with this information. A fumble will reveal that Bast was one of the thousand forms of Nihilathotep. Any agent that makes this discovery can make a natural test of plus 20%, and if they pass, they lose one stroke D4 sign to the terror of what kind of entity is now ruling their lives. After this, we move on to the trail of Bast. Agents who look into the recent influence that Bast has had can make up to three history roles. Each success gives them a portion of information. Failed roles mean they find nothing, however the next roll gets plus 20% to it, with it stacking until they are successful, though each failure costs one san. The nameless god's trail in modern history is surrounding that of cases of feral children that exhibit animal behaviour. Pain is a beacon to bast. The first success would be Myanmar in 1880. The events that transpired in Cornucopia House, or that of the book in the wall, could cause the agents to look for historical correlation. More on those in further videos. They can discover that a Charles Augustus Monroe, who was the Inspector General for the Imperial Indian Police, stationed in British Burma, sent a letter to his sister in 1880, where he talked about a raid that he took part in on a jungle village in the current Rakhine state that they suspected was helping guerrilla activity. The village was tamed easily, however, the officers heard screaming on the outskirts of the village. Munro went to investigate and saw what he described as, and I quote, a sight fit to incite the hardest soul's gorge into a rebellion. An elderly woman harried by a swarming horde of mongooses, rodents which young Hector can attest, are similar in form to the polecat ferret. The beast tore in two and threw the woman with a savagery unfit for description, dear sister, and my nightmares are nightly haunted by the image of my men futilely trying to rip the rabid pest from where they clung so tentatively to the woman's flesh. Her unbelievable demise and our futile attempts to forestall her fate were attended by a mute chorus of wide-eyed children lined up on the floor of the hut and watching the attack as if they paid to see one of the infamous cobra fights found in the less salubrious warrens of Arcadi. No response could be elicited from the children and prisoners taken from the village called the woman Ma Fei Wa or Yellow Ribbon Woman. Everybody lived in fear of the hearing and gave their resigned sick children to her care, scared she would bring down her wrath on the village if they refused. The letter is ended by a number of colonialist complaints about local superstitions and many of his officers soon went hunting and never returned. It's only through family coincidence from the British Raj that this incident still exists, though the raid does appear to have been sanctioned at the time. There is a history bonus called Saki. Inspector General Munro was the father of Hector Hugh Munro, an author who wrote under the pen name of Saki and inscribed the story Sredni Vashtar, which in part drew inspiration from his father's correspondence. The ferret's reference should concern any survivor of Cornucopia House. If they found Conradin's book, then the connection causes a potential sand hit, as the realisation that language could have in no way been used to reproduce these historical events. The second history role will reveal Cornwall 1952. Agents will start finding strange intersections of odd animal behaviour and the abuse of children. In Port Isaac there is a huge bird attack and die-off that killed a fisherman called Willis Emerson, who was driven off a cliff by a flock of cormorants that dropped dead after the attack. A week later it was reported by local news that a 12-year-old girl, Iris Belford, was found mute but alive in Emerson's cellar, identified only by a dirty embroidered blanket. She had been reported missing in the Blitz of 1941 and long thought dead as her parents were killed in a blast. Emerson was a known lifelong bachelor who came from Britchester in 1944. An unnamed constable who discovered Iris was reported to travel to London reunited with the surviving family members, though no record of them arriving is available. If a bonus bureaucracy roll is made, they discover Provost. It can be found that the Belford family never received Iris, and the constable Donald Provost, her escort, was reported missing by his wife. 
If the Provosts are contacted now, a lot has been forgotten, though a descendant of Melanie Hagen, formerly Provost, can remember a detail her grandmother used to say about her husband. Before he left, he told her, the birds in the sky done their duty, and now I must do mine. She never saw him again. The final success reveals Kenya, 1987. A village near Kenya's border, Dusasaso, was wiped out by thousands of baboons. By the time the army responded, the village was discovered abandoned, the populace torn from limb to limb. Extreme drought was given as a reason, though worse conditions had been seen before without such an incident. Witness accounts buried in records offices in Nairobi have, however, a different version of the story. Survivors claim that a few soldiers from the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement, or SPLM, fleeing the Second Sudanese Civil War. The men only paused there momentarily, wanting to desperately move on, and warning of the beast child. The baboons attacked that night, with a fleeing journalist reporting seeing a naked boy leading them. Some Kenyan soldiers were dispatched to look into it, worried about an SPLM incursion, but most returned empty-handed. Some never checked back in and were branded as deserters. The SPLM report was dismissed as a clever lies to engage a quicker military response than would have happened with a natural disaster. A bonus science role reveals fauna. The realisation will come to them that humans are in fact just animals, and if Basque can control the entire animal kingdom, that will include children and the agents themselves. An agent that realises that adulthood protects them from understanding and not control takes a sand here from helplessness. The next section is called the physics of Bast. Any agent with 50% or more in science can research the effect that Bast has upon probability on the subatomic level. It would of course require arrangement to use Switzerland's Large Hadron Collider, which needs a bureaucracy test and a wait of 46 months, though please bear in mind that it is closed between 2019 and 2022. If and when access is granted, it will need a series of science physics tests. If the agent or an assistant does a mathematics test before each test, then the agent will gain plus 20%, with each further mathematics test success revealing deeper revelations. The first success will reveal the BAST particle. It will be hypothesised that a subatomic particle exists in higher dimensions, as suggested by string theory, and the researcher can call this particle what they want, but it is called the BAST particle here for convenience. Changes to the particle can cause other particles to change as a result. The implications of this, should the researchers choose to publish them, would cause the field of quantum physics to flare for a time, but only as a normal hypothesis. If Bast's teeth conduct this testing, they gain plus 1% in unnatural and lose one sound based on their own experiences. Should the mathematics all be made, they will discover Heisenberg. The collapse of wave probabilistic functions due to the Bast particle can be reproduced in the work of other physicists, though the results are slightly different when being performed by the agent. Even when they observe it, the waveforms will collapse, though this should not be possible. The mathematical deviations are tiny, and yet there is evidence that indicate that physics acts in an abnormal manner around the teeth. They gain plus 1% on natural and lose another sun. The second success is around quantum engineering. Should charge and mass be influenced by enough Bast particles, they can cause an upwards ripple that alters the macroscopic world. Even though the laws of entropy limit these changes, it has quite profound implications. The example given is that the Bast particle could alter the function of neurons, and as such, mould behaviour patterns. Scaled upwards, this could see the quantum manipulation of evolution, and even physics itself. This would of course be limited by the consumption of energy, perceptive capabilities and a consciousness so vast as to have the ability to put this kind of thing into action. However, it is theoretically possible. The scientific community won't even entertain the idea, but the teeth that were involved in this research gain a further plus 1% on natural and lose another one sand due to their own experiences with behaviour and language that is warped by Bast. Should the mathematics rules succeed, they will discover computeronium. The possibility exists that Bast particles are used by a single consciousness that exists outside time, though it would still require energy to shape and perceive reality that could be detectable using human tools, though calculating the energy requirements would take processing abilities far beyond humanity. The power of a hypothetical computeronium, which would occupy around 68% of all matter in the universe that is currently explained away as dark energy. The hypothesis drawn from this is that the universe is part of Bast as opposed to the alternative. Again, another 1% on natural is gained and another 1% on sand lost. The third success is entropic consumption. Bast particles manifesting in dimensions we can observe appear to correlate with rising entropy, though there are hints that it is affected by entropic processes that in return affects or changes them. Jeremy England hypothesised that organic life evolution was tied to entropy, and as such the Bast particle could be tied to the very existence of life. 
Any teeth who examine this research get plus D4% in a natural and lose D4 sand, as they come to realise that life is predetermined by a malign power operating outside of time, manipulating reality to feed on death and entropy. If the mathematics role succeeds, they discover the factory farm. When they come to realise the manipulative possibilities of the Bast particle, it evokes questions with regard to causality. If it is indeed capable of fueling itself by stealing energy from every single subatomic interaction in the universe, it would not be unwise to think that it could rewrite the laws of physics to meet its demands. Organic life could have come into being simply to feed Bast more entropy. The universe is Bast's factory farm. They gain another D4% of the unnatural and lose another D4 san. Should further studies be conducted and they are one of the teeth, they can attempt a science physics or science mathematics role. Failure gains plus 1% unnatural and 1 sand loss, and success gains D4 unnatural and D4 sand loss. Should an agent be driven into breaking point during any stage of the Bass particle research, they gain an obsessive disorder that compels them to continue. Using a home pursuit for anything else needs a successful sand roll. An agent that has their sand reduced to zero for studying the Bass particle loses the ability to communicate with language, but gains an ability that no other human has had. They can reverse engineer their own cognition and collapse the wave function of the Bass particle using the power of thought. The researcher can do this compulsively with no discernible effect to outsiders looking to be trapped in catatonia. At the Large Hadron Collider, amazing things could be revealed. It causes the Bass particle to create the lightest Kaluza Klein particle, a theoretic exotic radiation specific to the Universal Extra Dimensional Theorem. This has the effect of killing a wide variety of biologists' life around them with radiation sickness as well as them themselves. We have a handout here entitled Entropy. Entropy is described here as the measure of disorder in a system, with the example being that with more possible states of matter, for example, water molecules vibrating as a liquid compared to water frozen at absolute zero, has more entropy. Molecules moving causes heat and humans see entropy as heat dissipating. However, entropy increases across every possible measurement at all opportunities. The universe should always be moving to disorder. The second law of thermodynamics is as such. The total entropy of an isolated system can only increase, and a system evolves to a state of thermodynamic equilibrium, maximal entropy. The largest known isolated system causes maximum entropy to happen as the theoretical heat death of the universe. This dissipation-driven adaptation sees life via the lens of this law. Life is volatile and chaotic. Stones absorb heat, plants absorb light and create sugars and gases. These all contribute to the rise of entropy. Stones can't compare with the plant's volatility without heat enough to melt it, whereas life requires low energy to create high entropy. The atoms life are made of hold that state to increase the system's entropy. The universe becomes thinner and dissipates until only death and stillness remain. Fires extinguish, cold emerges. Life only makes this quicker. The final section is called Killing. Essentially, though Delta Green may occasionally expect those with no training to kill, Bast expects it. Here we have a few inventive methods to do it. This cat's paws. It talks about America being haunted by guns and those that dream of firing them. Agents that face trouble can get armed men on the scene. Delta Green is more concerned with explaining away the unnatural, so the people not directly involved simply go home with only a killing to concern them. We have chemical weapons. It describes the method of creating chlorine gas that has 5% lethality and can stun like pepper spray. Industrial suppliers can turn up phosgene and it can be created using science chemistry. Similarly, cyanide gas can be created. There is explosives. It gives an easy way to create explosives and mentions that a little demolition skill can go a long way. Fire is next. Being trapped in a burning building causes 2d6 damage per turn and an enhanced blaze can inflict lethality 10% with demolitions or forensics being able to hide this. There's a hit and run which kind of speaks for itself. It has a 12% lethality rating for an ordinary car, with a drive test only being needed if they see you coming. We have Overdose. It talks about the use of fentanyl that has 15% lethality in D6 minutes, though getting it may be a problem. It mentions that naloxine should be kept handy in case the wrong target is injected. There is sabotage, you know, the kind of thing, cutting brake lines and the like. And finally, there is surprise attacks. Attacking an unaware target is a plus 20% to hit, with any hit being a critical. Also, killing people in their sleep works every time. Okay, that concludes part one of God's Teeth. Part two will be the first scenario of the campaign. Go forth.